Hello and thank you very much for tuning in to the podcast series by the New Silk Road Project. I am your host today, Charles Stevens, the founder of the New Silk Road Project. This series is dedicated to understanding and raising awareness of one of the most important development strategies of the 21st century, China's Belt and Road Initiative. The centerpiece of the New Silk Road Project, an initiative supported by Jeep, CSIS, Magellan Capital, the University of St. Andrews and Dennis Shirah, was to travel the course of the Silk Road economic belt from London to Yiwu in eastern China, interviewing the key actors and academics along its course. We will have to apologise in advance for some of the tangential moments in this podcast series and also the variable quality of audio footage. We do hope this series sheds important light into China's growing global presence and the significant changes taking place across Eurasia. DHL was one of the earliest players in the New Silk Roads and believing in the idea of a multimodal overland network which spanned across Eurasia. We had the pleasure of speaking to Thomas Kolvitsky, head of multimodal at DHL Freight. This is one of the companies utilising hubs such as Duisburg to transport commerce across Eurasia. From him, we learnt about some of the future opportunities for growth using these routes which China is supporting and subsidising. Actually, I mean, Thomas Kowitzki, as you said, uh, I'm uh, 50 years old. I'm uh, based in Germany looking after the China rail business uh, mainly. And uh, actually, I'm working for DHL Global Forwarding. Uh, we have us uh, looking, uh, and we have my, my Chinese uh, partners, um, which are looking after the Chinese market. I'm looking after the European market. Super, so a, bit, a big and an important role. Yeah. Um, and what you do is, of course, multimodal. It involves many, many different types of transportation. Um, your network must present significant logistical challenges, may that be sea freightage, land freightage. How are you working to overcome these? Yeah, I mean, actually, I mean, now, as you know, we as DHL, we are offering air freight and ocean freight services already uh, as one of the, our core products. And with the, um, now with the connection of the rail freight, we are completing somehow a, pic a picture where we are now offering all three transportation modes. And now from a DHL perspective, it's even more interesting because, I mean, we are as well, um, we are a parcel operator, we are an express operator. We are doing as well uh, freight overland in Europe. We are leading this and uh, we are connecting those bits and pieces. Um, and so we are creating more or less for our customers a really end-to-end -end network for all shipment sizes from the smallest item to the biggest full load container. So therefore, it's a, that's a perfect match for us. And in the context of the new Silk Road, which mode of transport, if you were to choose one, would you say is the most viable? Of course, rail. <laughs> And would you be happy to elaborate as to why? Yeah, I mean, actually, of course, rail, because uh, first of all, it's overland. I mean, there's clearly, I mean, uh, significant uh, advantages with this one. I mean, we are uh, compared to, uh, to the air freight, we are, um, this is much, much more cheaper, uh, much, much more economically. Um, from the ocean freight point of view, we are much, much more faster. So therefore, I mean, this is where, I mean, why I'm selecting rail, because, I mean, Customers, I mean, of course, they have different demands, different requirements. However, uh, I guess, I mean, with this rail freight, we are having a really perfect niche. And this is why I still vote for, for rail, which is more, for an important one. And, and DHL was one of the earliest players in the Belt and Road Initiative. I mean, people like Wade Shepherd and, and, of course, your marketing material is very geared around it. Correct. What made you engage in it so early on? Oh, that was already, I mean, even before the BRI was launched, I mean, we are already, I mean, in the uh, late of the 2005, 2006, we already investigated how can we leverage the Trans-Siberian way already much, much more overland um, and actually, then the strong push, of course, came through the master plan from uh, from China, which is um, and at that time we had already, I mean, a project 
completed, pre-analysis is done. Uh, I mean, we had already big plans um, to how we can push it, how we can leverage it. And, uh, and, and since then, I mean, actually, we have really developed uh, accordingly as well with the additional capabilities from the rail operators, uh, which are perfectly fitting with us because as more capabilities as they are, as more options we can give to our customers. And, uh, and therefore, I mean, actually, we are really, um, yeah, I mean, when we started this 10 years ago, with a small project team, very more or less high level. Uh, we are now, I mean, having an organization in place who is dedicated to rail freight in Europe, within my team, and as well, I mean, with, with China, with a dedicated team. Uh, I'm, I mean, if you see this journey uh, from a small idea to a really, I mean, more or less full setup, where, I mean, uh, volumes are now sustainable, where customers are demanding, I think this is really, I mean, a very nice uh, development and shows as well the potential of this, um, of, of this, uh, of this project. And, and this project focuses attention on Eurasia, on Europe and Asia. You as a company are, are international. What are you doing in, in places like Africa and Latin America? Yeah, I mean, actually, it's an interesting question. I mean, actually, we see, of course, I mean, why the, the rail freight and the, the one road, one belt very much started with connecting China and Europe. We already realized that a lot of um, a potential, um, how we can connect as well other regions. And we already carry shipments which are coming originally from Asia Pacific, uh, even from Vietnam, uh, from South Korea, from Japan, which are um, transshipped via China with rail to Europe, where we are as well accessing North, Northern Africa. So, uh, and if we now look into um, specifically the South route, yeah, I mean, which is now more and more developing. Of course, this is as well a perfect opportunity as well, I mean, to, to connect much, much more the Middle East area and the growing emerging markets, Iran, um, however, and, and entire Africa. Latin America, I mean, this is more, I mean, uh, as yeah, so far, I mean, this is, of course, I mean, from a pers geographical perspective, is quite, uh, uh, is, is quite, uh, how, how, how I, should, I would say, a challenge. However, what we see is that, I mean, even customers um, from South or from, uh, from Americas are really interested in the China Rail uh, options. Um, because, I mean, sometimes the capabilities going via, uh, via direct route ocean freight is sometimes as well taking with the capabilities a long time. And uh, with this speed and with this development of the, China, of the China trains, you can, and the accessibility between Europe and Latin America, you see as well, or America, you see as well the customers investigating this potential as well. How can I leverage a China rail um, footprint to connect those markets. For me, a little bit as well, I was then I was thinking when I started, let's first of all get the first step done by um, um, looking into China and Europe, but we see more and more as well, this is really a global initiative. I agree. And <laughs> since 2013, how has your role in it changed? How, 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 both expanded, adapted, Progressed. Yeah, I mean, actually, when we started, it was really focused on, I mean, a small project. We were doing it on top of a lot of other tasks. Mm -hmm. um, but more and more, I saw um, that as well as the development and uh, the increasing complexity, the increasing as well demand. I mean, more and more customer requirements came in, more and more players came in. And now, actually, uh, what we are now doing, we are doing the full end to end logistics, including organization of containers, including uh, organizing the pre and on carriage from the trains to the trains. I mean, we are, um, uh, um, we are doing some sort of uh, supply chain uh, storage uh, in, uh, in between. So, therefore, this uh, it, it started with a very very basic, um, okay, let's move a, um, containers from A to B, but now we see already it's, uh, we are doing containers, we are doing um, uh, grouped shipments, we are connecting this as well to networks. I mean, uh, so therefore, uh, now uh, it's an enlarged team, expanded team. Um, we have uh, the scope, the geographical, geographical scope of the product is much, much more wider than this. So therefore, if, if I'm somehow looking at it from a very early beginning with one train starting from China to Europe, now we have multiple trains, multiple people, multiple, um, and, and, and of course, a, a much, much bigger volume 
which we are carrying over the, over this uh, over this product. Do, do, do you have some figures that you could give us on, on the number of people or the number of trains across across your network or in the context of? Yeah, we are looking. I mean, we are we are having in our somehow in our. Uh, focus uh, 45 lanes, which we are train lanes, which we are uh, using yeah, between China and Europe. Um, I mean, in terms of uh, um, people, I mean, we are talking about yeah, around about 100 uh, people really dedicated already uh, in China and Europe after after this business. And today we're talking in Duisburg. Why did you choose? Mala as your as your control hub for these China trains. What why not Duisburg or Lodz or another another big multimodal hub? Well, I mean, actually, we are we are using Wuch uh, and 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 Duisburg. The evolution was that when when we started that uh, Mala Shvitsche because of the of the geographical location. I mean, uh, strategic uh, location where you're entering Europe. This is where we as DHL had already anyhow an office before where we said this is the perfect location for all the trains which are anyway passing to China and coming from China where we need to be and we would like to as well to expand. And uh, therefore we used Malashevich as one of our um, uh, of our of, of our competence centers, uh, operation competence center, where we are managing those flows, because it's as well a very tipping point where you have the gauge change, we have we, are, we have you're connecting as well the inter-European rail network with the China network. So therefore, that that was a perfect fit. Why we made this this decision to go to Malashevice. However, in the meanwhile, we have over the time we have expanded as well. We have now a competence team in Warsaw. We have a competence team in Wuch, we have a competence team as well in Germany, and I mean actually with these hubs like uh, Duisburg, Hamburg, uh, um, uh, uh, Nuremberg, I mean we are using as well those locations where we are, and you see, we are today in Duisburg, we have as DHL a facility here where we as well leverage those, um, uh, those uh, our network which we have in, in DHL, which are close as well to the railway terminals where, um, where, the, where the China trains are coming and going. So therefore, it's, um, we have in, in, in started with one location, but now we have already multiple um, operational rail competence centers, and this is as well goes in line with the, with the growth of this business. Yeah. Thank you. And, and you touched on it earlier, but you're, um, it seems to be that, that the Belt and Road Initiative has catalyzed both from DHL's perspective as an, and other big logistics companies' engagement with overland, specifically rail freighted routes. Correct. Why was this not something engaged with to a greater extent 20 years ago? Well, I mean, of course, I mean, this opportunity of uh, which, I mean, these investments which are made now uh, was, of course, needed. Right. I mean, actually, customers look after reliable solutions, and they ex what they expect. I mean, if you look at the brand of DHL, there's a certain aspiration, certain expectation behind this, and and uh, and with this Belt and Road Initiative, this is perfectly as well fitting to those. Before, I mean, it was really simply not good enough to leverage um, from uh, with the, with the existing structure at that time. Now, I mean, with this. Uh, capabilities, and even if you see the numbers of trains which are running and the lead times you are achieving, that was not possible 10 years ago. And this is as specifically as well the value proposition of this product, because I mean customers they, they are having high demand of their of, of, of their product. They need a reliable solution. They would like to have a secure solution. They would like to have visibility end to end. And these are I mean all factors which I mean you have. It's it's not just running a train. It's as well the bells and whistles around it, which makes really truly as well a powerful product. And with this opportunity comes increased competition. How are you dealing with this to stay ahead of the game? Yeah, I mean, actually, we are ahead of the game, first of all, <laughs> because, I mean, because we, of course, um, uh, we were quite already early in uh, saw the potential of this product. Well, competition is always good. 
I mean, actually, because uh, always as well to challenge yourself, I mean, to look as well after as well, I mean, uh, um, newer, new solutions. So, and, and even we are as well um, working and, um, I mean, we are uh, comprehending, each, comprehending each other. So, I mean, from that perspective, I mean, we, I, it's, it's good to have competition because it makes yourself stronger. Because if you are not good enough, you will, I mean, as well, I mean, uh, you, uh, yeah, I mean, then, then, of course, your, your own engagement and, 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 the, and the own product is, is, is not growing. So, therefore, competition is always healthy. And China is advocating environmentally friendly solutions as part of the Belt and Road. How, how are you as a company helping to green well, I mean, we have um, I mean, a Go Green program uh, within DPDHL. We have big targets as well to reduce our emissions uh, by 2025. And this is perfect, I mean, with this BRI fitting in. I mean, um, you know, rail freight is an environmental um, friendly solution. And, um, and therefore, we are as well, I mean, this is well obviously one of the key topics which we always as well make sure as well um, in the discussions with customers, this is environment friendly. This is how you can reduce factually CO2 um, instead of just, for example, going by, by air, which where the, of course, the CO2 um, uh, uh, emission is much, much more higher. So therefore, it's a, it's a perfect as well um, completion of the picture um, where we are, can as well offer customers CO2 um, solutions. And of course, connect as well with other um, um, activities which we are doing. I mean, like with our street scooter, where we have, have electric cars, um, and uh, and our other go green uh, initiatives. Therefore, it's yeah, it's it's um, as well supporting this this is an important program. And I have been yesterday as well to a customer, and I was specifically as well asking about that question because we talked a lot of times about. Okay, how fast it need to be, how reliable it should be, how 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 cost effective it should be, and I ask the question: How important do you see, as well as the CO two impact? And uh, and and they immediately reacted: This is, I mean, they have their own targets as well, and how can they um, um, achieve such targets if they are not doing some tangible uh, topics? And this, I guess, is a tangible um, um, product mode. Uh, which or production mode where you can achieve CO2 um, uh, um, emission um, uh, 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 reductions. And focusing on the client, an end-to-end -end solution has huge advantages, but engagement in China involves involving Chinese partners. Yeah. How are you balancing these Necessities. Yeah, this is where, of course, our powerful Chinese organization comes in. I mean, we as DHL, we have a very strong network in, in China. I mean, we, are, we have uh, above 40, 50 um, uh, offices where we are connecting uh, uh, China. And this is a big, big as well advantage which we are having. I mean, customers who are sitting in Europe who are not really familiar with the Chinese um, activities, we can help them. Uh, because we are, we speak local. We have local contacts. We are, we are arranging um, um, the the, the, the um, uh, all the transportation needs accordingly. And uh, and uh, yes, and, and this is as well one of the powerful as well advantages we have as a global organization, because we have streamlined systems. We have as well. I mean, we have one voice. We have one um, one process uh, which we are we are, which we are working at, and that is um, how we as well can. Um, uh, provide end-to-end -end solutions out of one hand instead of just uh, piggybacking on partners or I mean or on, uh, uh, on, on on local providers because we have it all really end-to-end -end -end in one hand. And some critics have have questioned the the underlying value proposition of overland rail freightage. Firstly, do you agree with this? And if you do agree with this, what goods? Does this value proposition apply to? Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the value proposition for me is very clear, and we see this. And otherwise, this demand and after this growth would not be somehow happening. But what we see is, of course, I mean, when we see when this when in, in the beginning it was very much 
somehow glued to high value goods, automotive, high tech, high tech uh, industry. But in the meanwhile, we see all industry, industry sectors. I mean, we see uh, chemicals, we see engineering manufacturing, we see consumer retail fashion. Um, I mean, therefore, I mean, it's, there's no limit anymore, right? I mean, and we thought in the beginning, it's more or less a niche product for a niche sector. But this is not true anymore. I mean, actually, we see really that the demand is from each sector because the 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 the, the, the need for short-term reliable uh, supply chain solutions is everywhere, and um, and and so f I would not limit it to certain cargo anymore. Um, uh, however, of course, it is I mean perfectly fitting, of course, for cargo where I mean uh, you are somehow don't have the um, which don't have this high costs, I mean, of, 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 of the product, because, I mean, if you take, for example, take a 40-foot container where you're having 20 tons uh, 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 cross, weight, uh, cross weight in it, or 21 tons, I mean, looking into details, I mean, if you ship this by air, I mean, actually, and go now, um, you would pay really a fortune. You know, at the end of the day, logistics costs, logistics logistic spend costs, I mean, actually, you can, of course, re tremendously reduce by this. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, if you have, if you're going via ocean freight, you really wait six to eight weeks or until you have your cargo in Europe, and that sometimes is too long because customers really are demanding for it. So therefore, this is a clear value proposition where I mean, where we have a economical um, uh, um, good solution for the customers, and as well from a, um, uh, from a cost point of view. So therefore, this is I mean, uh, what we see. Uh, and why as well, uh, and, and, and we have as well cases where as well customers are saying, okay, I have a problem in this area and uh, because of ca uh, capacity um, uh, and, and we are looking for new ways. And this is something which as well is um, very often now as well demand which we see. So even, I mean, like we, we spoke before about uh, Africa, I did never expect that we are that uh, that that via rail we are connecting China, Europe to Africa. So therefore, it's it's uh, it's it's really a platform now which is uh, having really um, from a cost, cost and uh, from lead time perspective, his advantages and customers. I mean, this is why they are as well choosing this. And uh, and uh, at the end of the day, I mean, uh, of course, a customer can only. They they uh, they can only tell what their requirements are, and and we, we don't know sometimes really all the details. But uh, if you would like to reduce capital costs, I guess this is as well something which is um, quite important, and uh, therefore you need to have reliable, fast solutions. And this is what's happening with the uh, with this transportation mode. And as you increase your scope, the climatic variations between the zones are mm. inevitably also going to increase. How are you protecting the cargo? Yeah, I mean, actually, there are different options which we are providing. And because, in, 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 of course, you have in winter the extreme of, I mean, extreme cold winters, in some extreme hot summers, and uh, and we are offering, of course, to our customers reefer temperature controlled containers for such businesses. We are offering as well insulated containers. I mean, uh, and this is how we cover um, as well those temperature controlled or temperature requirements. And, and earlier we, we mentioned very briefly, the, the, I think it was before we went on film, but the, the southerly corridor and with the construction of the Cars Tbilisi Baku line, the electrification of the Tehran Mashhad line and yes. the wider Iranian network. Yes. It's very exciting. Is absolutely, this... absolutely. And then we are as well, of course, uh, we are already using this lane. I mean, we are already carrying, yeah, we have already projects running uh, via the South Cor Corridor, and we have as well, I mean, uh, and, and we, we didn't speak so far, I mean, so much about Turkey, but Turkey is as well, I mean, this as well is for us a fantastic uh, market. And, um, and via the South Corridor, um, uh, we see a lot of advantages, uh, not only in, in terms of transit time, but as well, much, much more as well to connect as well the Southeastern Europe area. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's perfectly, I mean, fitting in that we have more or less, we have the northern route, we have the western route, we have the southern route to accommodate as well the different needs of the customers from these geographical areas. And therefore, I mean, we are, why we are testing and why we are as well very much pushing this south corridor solution uh, already, I mean, um, via, via, uh, directly via, via Aktau or via um, Kazakhstan. 
And if I may push you on that a bit further, you're currently using for, uh, shipping across the Caspian Sea. Are you considering Iran, Iran as a as a subsidiary route or as a a viable alternative? Um, Iran at the moment. Due to this, I mean, political discussion is, of course, is a bit, uh, uh, I mean, a, a bit difficult for us. However, we see definitely the potential uh, in this one. And um, and once, I mean, of course, uh, I mean, we have really again the open the open uh, trade possibilities there. I mean, we see definitely there the potential to um, to bring cargo via um, from China via those southern route to Iran or the other way around. Yeah, that's definitely, we see as well even India more and more requests, uh, if you're now just taking just the, the next um, more or less geographic area, the same there, I mean, uh, this connection um, with India and Europe is as well something in the long term which is coming, definitely coming by, by, by overland. And it's interesting that you mention India and in that it raises the more geopolitical aspects of the New Silk Road and, mm. and, uh, and the Bells and Road Initiative. How are you balancing, as a German headquartered company, the economic incentives which the Belt and Road offers, as well as your your commitment to Germany's political agenda? Well, I mean, actually, we are using the one road, one belt as an opportunity to for our transport network, right? I mean, and we are. I mean, there's a lot of discussions around who's supporting, not supporting. We see the clear value proposition. At the end of the day, we are logistics provider. I mean, we are doing transportations. We are seeing the values, and uh, and and this is where we are focusing on, right? So therefore, this is where I mean, uh, and 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 the connectivities from countries and the support from countries is of course very welcome. I mean, which is always good. I mean, because if you somehow fight against, I mean, some somehow local um, uh, 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 obstacles, this is not good. This is not healthy. I mean, this is what we not don't want. This is not our customers don't want. I mean, actually, we would like to explore this one road, one belt, and uh, and I think with this one road, one belt, a lot of countries are supporting this in Europe. In the, in, in the transit countries, in China, and, uh, and I guess, I mean, this is something where we are really focusing and what we are leveraging on. Thank you. And one of my last questions, if you were going to summarize the, the Belt and Road Initiative in a single word, what, what does it mean to you? For me, it's connectivity. I mean, actually, I mean, it's, it's, it's really fantastic to see. I mean, it's not in terms of connectivity of countries or regions. Uh, it's as well about connectivity between transportation modes. If you see, I mean, more or less what's happening from end to end, how many transportation modes are involved, I mean, you need to have excellent connectivity um, to give, I mean, because it's much, much more than running a train from A to B. I mean, uh, there's a warehouse, there's a, there's a customer. You need somehow to connect this. And, uh, and therefore, for me, connectivity is the key word here.